But dun 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 but dun dun now wow wow but na 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 How many of you said tequila? It should be one hundred percent of you. Anytime that song is anywhere, I don't care if I'm being held at gunpoint in a terrorist cell somewhere and some guy down the hall is playing that song, my dying words will be tequila. Because that's what happens. You can't not, you, you got to fill in the blank. It's like if someone says cracker, jack. You know, you, you like like stop and go. You, know, you want to fill it. Dun, 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 dun. Good, the chat's all typing tequila. That's fantastic. Welcome to the Day 9 Daily. This is Day 9 Daily number 287. We're going to learn to be a better gamer. And today's little analysis is something that was suggested via Twitter, where someone said, why don't you do more map analysis? Because that was a very, very popular theme in Brood War. But really, the whole map making and changing of play styles based upon map is only just really beginning in StarCraft II. So we're going to take a look at one of the brand spanking fresh new maps, Slag Pits. We just grabbed a fairly random old game. There's some guy whose name is all Korean and another player whose name is something prime. So at the very least know that it's at some reasonable caliber of play. So we're going to discuss the map first, and then we're going to watch the game from the Zerg's point of view, and then we're going to restart it and watch it from the Protoss's point of view, and see the sort of considerations that we need to make, all based upon the map, and also Slag Pits is pretty simple, and also my glasses will never really be perfectly clean, so I guess I'm going to have to deal with my vision being a little bit filthy. It's not a big deal. Now, I wanted to uh, tell all of you I'm very excited because I got a well-played shirt. Yeah! And the best part about the shirts from well-played is that they smell nice when they arrive. Oh, I know, Brent. I know you sent me this shirt. and you were asking, did it get there? And it didn't. When I opened it up, <gasps> it was so fresh. Because I don't know, for instance, if you've ever ordered a t-shirt online and it comes in one of those packages and you open it up and it just smells weird. And you're like, I'm not putting that on. Shirt I ordered on the internet. So you have to wash the shirt that you just ordered before you can wear it. I'm very curious to see if this happens to anyone else, but really, this has been my almost universal experience with ordering t-shirts on the internet, how it's like sort of like saran wrap, and you open it up, and it's just... Okay, let's just wash this bad boy. I was very excited to be wearing the angelic white. So let's go ahead and bounce into the game. I guess the only announcements that I have to make is for next week's Fun Day Monday and next week's Newbie Tuesday, which would, of course, be tomorrow and the day after that. Fun Day Monday! You are not allowed to build um, roaches or hydras or mutas or banelings, and you're only allowed to build 12 zerglings or less. That's right, Spanishiwa's been doing it all day, and he's been winning games in the Grandmaster League. Except to Combat X. I said it. That's right. Um, submit those to Monday at day9.tv. For Tuesday, if you could rewatch Day 9 Daily number 285, that's where we explored all the goody goodness that is, of course, going to be the, um, that was the, um, was it 285? It was, it was 285. It was about the idea of refining a build, creating building groups, fitting in unit mixes, refining it down and down and down. Uh, so if you could submit a full replay pack of the game with the build that you're stealing, the building groups you created in them, uh, the unit mixes that you did, I want like 10 replays in there. I want like a full gigantic set of freaking games. It's going to be unbelievable. Send it to Tuesday at Day9.tv. And if there is anything else to announce, ah, ah, next week, it's going to be 2v2 week. We're going to be doing a week's worth of 2v2s. Feel free to tweet me suggestions or replays of players you want to see or games that you thought were amazing. Tweet me at Day9TV. Oh, it's going to be awesome. Let's go into the game that's on Slag Pits. So you know what? I actually don't want to begin the daily this way. I don't want to begin looking at this. Pfft. Let's quit this game. Let's get on out of there. And let's look at this area right... Oh, we can't look at it that way. All right, multiplayer. All right, 3v3. Oh, I was playing 3v3s. How embarrassing. Going down here to Slag Pits. How do you look at the map? This is a true tragedy that it will not let you look at the map. That is totally more than okay because what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and Google Slag Pits and we're going to check it out. Now, whenever I look at a map, there's two things that I always want to spend a pretty long time looking at. That is how the natural expansion is formed 
and where my third base is going to be, because that's going to have a significant influence on how things get played. Here is Slag Pits. Bun -dun 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 -dun. Bum -bum. Slag Pits, everyone's favorite random, random, random map that Blizzard included. Things I want you to know about Slag Pits. First of all, we have uh, four mains. One, two, three, and four, positioned in a diamond shape. If we look at the natural expansions, let's actually just use the top base as our reference point. Here's a natural expansion, and it's pretty widespread out. In particular, my ramp does not really defend my natural expansion very well. So in other words, think of a map like the original Lost Temple or on Shattered Temple. Your ramp points inward to the expo. So it's really easy to cover your ramp and expansion at the same time. But I want you to just pretend with me. Let's say that we're Protoss. Let's actually zoom in here. Let's say that we're Protoss up at this position. If we build cannons here, if he would just run some Zerglings over here, he can immediately hit our expansion and we can't exactly cover it. So that's kind of one of the first concerns, is that we have not just a um, wide open natural expansion, but also one that is far away from our choke. So that means we have three points we need to defend at the start of the game. Well, I guess two points. We need to defend our choke ramp and our natural. Good. Uh, the other thing I want to note is that where do we take our third expansion? Let's pull out. Again, envision that you're up here. Terran players, where would you want to take your third base? Protoss players and Zerg players, where would you want to take your third base? This is very, very important to do, just to look at this exercise. Well, I mean, assuming our opponent doesn't spawn in closed positions, I guess I would want to expand to this place as a third. Um, Location-wise, I mean, we could expand here, but this is a little bit of an awkward base because, you know, we kind of have to go down this way and then back and expand. So then all of a sudden we have three points to defend, this ramp, our natural, and our third base. So, oh my goodness. <gasps> Oh, this map doesn't look so good for an expanding ish player, right? It's not something like, what's a map where you can get a lot of easy expos? Crossfire! You can get all sorts of easy expansions. Almost any direction you attack in, there's an expo along the way. Just expand there. Taldarim Altar has some super easy to defend third. Oh my gosh, look up Taldarim Altar. The third base is so easy to defend. You have almost no widespread out space that you need to cover. So in essence, what I would argue for this map is a couple of very, very simple concepts. You're going to need a good amount of units to defend your first base because units are the only thing that can bounce back and forth between these two. And you're going to need a lot of units to defend the third base. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. The one thing we haven't talked about is this center area. It's a little funky on this version because it's a large white circle. That's the vision range of a Zelnaga watchtower that's in the center right here. But there's no really well-defined center on this map. That's another very important thing to note. So, now that we've talked about the center and the expansions, we've briefly just said kind of need a lot of units there. So, for instance, on this map... Uh, let's do some strategies. Since we're doing a Protoss versus Zerg, let's just pick the Protoss pieces on this map for Protoss. If a Protoss spawned up here, what strategy do we not like? For me, I really don't like doing a Colossus Void Ray heavy play, any sort of air heavy play, because man, I mean, how do we defend that third base on a map like Shakura's Plateau? Oh, that's easy to end up holding a third base. I mean, just rewatch Mondragon vs. Um, Cruncher or Idra vs. Cruncher. You clearly see how Cruncher is able to secure three bases very, very easy on that map. Um, on this, ooh, not so much. I might want more gateway units. I mean, I can envision Blink Stalkers being pretty good. Yeah, I can bounce all around between these two bases and then maybe Blink down here to protect this. Cool stuff. But also for the center, what I want to note is that all the paths are very tight. There's a little tight path here, a little tight path here. This side path is a little bit tight. So the big power units that work well in those tight spaces, like the Colossus, the Siege Tank, and Festers, all going to be very, very potent on this map. Big, wide, spread out sort of map. I always try to look for some key con mm, excuse me, some key control points. If we can hold this Zelnaga Watchtower, we can just sort of funnel things through this entrance and through this entrance and through this one. So if we can control the center, we can bounce back and forth between these two key pieces of terrain. Controlling the center might actually be a little more important on this map than on others, but plenty of room for counterattacking. 
Seems to make sense. I'd want to do a lot of counterattacking if I were on this map. Let's actually jump into our game now. Now that it turns out we couldn't load it up into the game. After we've noted, we can't really do any sort of cutesy defenses. So we know that, for instance, a Zerg might be a little bit leery to do something like, you know, do a lot of expanding and mutilisk play because it's so hard to defend all those spread out spaces. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. The other thing that's now very important to note is that the distances are very short. I mean, if we just pass from this top area down along this uh, lane, we are very quickly at our opponent's natural. I mean, even looking at the mini-map, Slag Pits is actually a very, very small map, a very intense map. We're going to want to do a lot, 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 lot of two-base play. Very, very important to do the two-base play on this map. So there we now have Cheetah Prime. Moving on out. Scouting along. Obviously, we want to be scouting this um, upper left area first. We don't want to deal with any close positions. Very important to do. Oh, yeah, this is Cheetah Prime, our Protoss. This is our Zerg player. Somebody. It's in Korean. The important thing, though, is less to think about what the players are and who the players are and what their styles are, and more just about the map. There were actually some good games on Slag Pits that had some really good players, like LG Pain User was watching some of his games on Slag Pits, but people know about his style. People already have all this baggage. We don't want any baggage. We want to be thinking nice and pure. So let's look at Protoss's point of view first on this map. Let's get off his first person freaking camera. Immediately, now that we're in the game mode, we can start to discuss some things that may not have been so apparent when we were looking at this big, broad overhead view on this map. Didn't mean to go to me. You guys got the treat of my neck. Here's a huge amount of space right here. Very vulnerable for drop-oriented play. Very vulnerable for mutilisk-oriented play. But I'm likely not going to be that concerned about mutilisk-oriented play. Um, just because I can put so much pressure on my opponent, given these very short distances and given how hard it is for him to defend his natural. On a map uh, with a little more closed space, you could reasonably do something like build a giant wall of spine crawlers, but as we're moving over here, again, let's pause to come back and look at this expansion. Look at how wide spread open the expansion is. We really have to control this whole area and this whole area if we want to be able to just secure this little tiny old base. Very, very rough to do. So we're going to see our good friend Cheetah Prime begin advancing forward. Uh, he's starting to move up. There's the spawning pool right there. All right, cool. All right, cool. And what I'm going to do after we've watched this from the Protoss point of view for a little bit is we're going to come back and we'll begin to rewatch the entire game and think about it in terms of another map that has some similar features, Zelnaga Caverns, so we can get some base points to end up making some decisions with. All right, there's the cybernetics core going down. Everything is as expected. There's the block going down at the natural expansion. Removing the production tab. Just going to be spotting this for as long as possible. Now, this is a pretty reasonable play to do uh, on any map. Just, you know, oh, I'm going to block his expansion, and that's going to be awesome. However... Part of the reason why this is so significant to do, far more so significant on other maps, is that the longer we block this, the fewer units he has. Okay, now that seems, like, obvious and great. It seems like you'd always want to prevent him from having more units. But why is it even more important on slag pits? Keep relating it back to the map, right? Things just aren't good in general. They're good for a reason, right? So on this map, if he has less units, then how the hell is he going to defend this ramp? I mean, theoretically, if he spreads creep way far forward, he can build, like, spine crawlers here. But those won't even begin to cover this area of terrain. He needs units to defend this ramp. On a map like Shakura's Plateau, sure, you can block him for a little while, but he doesn't really need that many units to defend his front, so he's more than happy to begin teching up, to begin getting more queens up. It's going to be absolutely fine for a Zerg most of the time. I mean, again, no Zerg wants to have his natural expansion hatchery blocked, but on this map, it's, it's going to be a little bit scarier. So he will be pulling back. Tragedy, tragedy, tragedy. Oh, how sad. Now, what's very cool to me about StarCraft II as a game in comparison to Brood War as a game is that 
a lot of the map design decisions and the influences uh, are a little bit more tactical in nature. In StarCraft II, there was... We're going to ignore this for a moment. In StarCraft II, there was a big strategic element. There was a big, you really need to get five lurkers here and shut down this piece of terrain. All right, seems pretty reasonable. But the thing to note is that in StarCraft II, there's not nearly as many space controlling units. You can't just plant five units at position X and it's unbreakable. You could actually do that with all the races in Brood War. In StarCraft II, it's a lot more about your units being able to kind of do fancy, cute things. So a little tiny set of constricted pathways suddenly makes zealots and force fields way more amazing so you can all of a sudden begin doing pushes and be in funky locations and put a lot of pressure um, on the opponent just given that little tiny tactical advantage that you can do so we're seeing a cheetah prime he's throwing down his first gateway and he's building a twilight council i want you to think about all the openings that could deviate from this even the absurd ones like the zealot uh legs with speed or going for Blink, or going for Dark Templar. Those last two are the more common ones. Zealot Legs, a little bit less common. But we're seeing so many sentries get made, I would probably be doubting that. But we're seeing the usual three-gate mixture. Trying to move on out to the front. I'm pretty much just thinking about my two base considerations. How do I get my second base safely right now? Probably would not want to go one gate, stargate, expand. A little bit tough to hold that off. I like three gate and then doing something else. Is he really going to be? Okay, no. It looks like he is going for Dark Templar. At first I was like, is this boy really going for charge? He's nuts. And per usual. Uh, we're getting just the ever so slightest bit of information. We see Zerglings with speed going down. I immediately want to note that with Slag Pits coming back, anytime you see Zerglings with speed, you have to worry about counterattacks from this angle. Uh, and something that a lot of players don't think about is that th there are some destructible rocks back here. They don't actually come into play that much. Here, here's one set of destructible rocks here and another set. But if Zerg opens that up, this is hell for Protoss to try to deal with whenever he's trying to move out. Speed Zerglings are an extremely, extremely large threat on this map. So I do like the fact that we are seeing our Protoss player just do a little bit more defensive stuff. Moving out with a Zealot and two sentries. You know, it's kind of funny to note about this mix. I was... <coughs> oh, that sneeze was was just... I, oh, I've been begging for that sneeze to happen for like three minutes. I'm so happy that I started saying things with the letter N in it, which so just vibrated my nostrils enough. Oh my god, what a release. Alright, cool, coming on back. Uh, now, strategy-wise, strategy-wise, I do kind of want to note that, hey, you know what? Doing this will trick my opponent into not thinking that I'm going for a Dark Shrine so much, right? It will trick him. He will think that I'm going for three gate. That's just basic strategy that you can do on any map. But again, uh, to come back, one of the reasons why we like Dark Templar is that they operate so well in these huge open spaces. Dark Templar rushes, think about Shakura's Plateau. That map has the smallest entrance to your natural. You put one Overseer there, done. DTs are doing nothing Ever. They're terrible. On this map, huge, wide, spread open spaces. Oh, oh, so good, so good, so good, so great, so fantastic. Oh, so lovely. Air units from Cheetah, not going to be as good because there's so much space that has ground over it that it's very easy to just chase down a couple of air units with uh, your Zerg units. There's the usual harassment. If I'm Zerg, I'm going to be feeling a little teensy bit suspect right now. There is the Nexus, finally, that is going down right now. But all of a sudden, there's not as much of a consideration to make from a Protoss player's point of view. We have already decided the strategy based upon uh, a number of factors. The one that I'm emphasizing today is the map. We've already chosen this, and it's important just to play it out properly and not to let anything sort of get in your way early on. We saw the Zerglings with speed. If we didn't see Zerglings with speed, we might be a little bit leery of some sort of roach play, but we're constantly just seeing a couple of Zerglings. I'm very excited to see the Dark Templar pop out. There they pop out. There's a third one going out. Now, do we like three Dark Templars? Do we like that many? 
On Shakur's Plateau, for instance, I would really not make three Dark Templars if I did end up Dark Templar rushing in the first place. The fact that he is doing three, I think, well aligns with his overarching goals of, you know, putting a lot of pressure on this sort of widespread outedness to it. We see a bunch of Zerglings starting to spread in, so he definitely needs to try to defend against this. Curious to see if he's going to transition out of this for a little bit, so let's just watch him do damage for a little bit. This is obviously great. He's doing a ton of damage. There's a spore crawler in the way. All right. All right, we're hanging out. That's good. Doing a little bit of damage. And we're going to see this stuff get torn up. Now, suddenly, once this ends up uh, sort of wrapping itself up, oh my goodness, we defend against the Dark Templar. It's very important that we take a couple of important steps. Now, here's some Protoss strategy moment. Let's suppose for a moment that these two Dark Templar died. Hmm. Our Dark Templar, they're dead. Let's suppose that they just died. What should we do now as Protoss? Strategically, what would be a couple of good things to do just in general? Just in general, just based on what we've seen. This is the, I need to do this on every map sort of style. It's important to be able to make these distinctions. Right now, what I'm seeing is... Here's two hatcheries. Here's a third hatchery. There's a spore crawler. Wow, I guess with no layer, I do not need to really worry about any sort of overseers coming up soon. So I can make one or maybe two Dark Templar for defense, and I'm great. I'm actually amazingly well defended for a long time. That's something that any Zerg player could do, or excuse me, any Protoss player could do on this map. Now, now that we've done a little bit of damage, I want you to think about the map, all right? The, I've said really obvious stuff, right, thus far. Really wide open map. Really wide open map. Where did I get that piece of information? Well, I got that by thinking about our second base and just taking a glance at the map. But mainly it's the second base. Again, when analyzing a map, how do I get my natural, my first base up? Or excuse me, my first expo up, which would be my second base. And how do I get my third base up? Um... Right? So from the first one, we said, man, that's a really wide open map. In fact, it's so freaking gosh darn damn open that, you know what, it's even hard to get my third expansion up. Okay? So we've said that it's hard, it's hard for us to get expansions up. All right? I'm kind of beating the same dead horses while I'm getting some answers popping up in the chat. So some people are suggesting uh, the usual transitions, like build a robo and begin to get Colossus. I don't actually like Colossi particularly much on this map this early. I actually think that that's going to be a little bit weak to get Colossus so fast because of how huge and spread and open and wide the whole area is. And it means we kind of have to hole up and play defensively and we completely sack map control. What I actually think would be a little better would be to add on more gateways and to put pressure on gateway-wise. We even have the Twilight Council, so we can begin doing a little bit more pressure that way. And then once we have five or six gateways up, we can get a third base pretty easily. Again, keep thinking about things in terms of how you get your extra bases. That's really the most fundamental thing. That's actually why we're doing slag pits as one of the first map analyses. There's not some amazing po tactical points going on. Like on Lost Temple, there was the high ground going on. On Blistering Sands, there was your backdoor destructible rocks. On this map, you should have space. Expand a lot. Enjoy your space. Her. So it's so important that you kind of obey that, right? So you need lots of units to defend your first base. And that's exactly kind of what we saw, a three-gate opening in these Dark Templars. And now, if we want to get ourselves another base, we, we just kind of need to slam down some more gateways. So I'm going to continue to look at Cheetah Prime. Oh, good Cheetah. And is he getting blink? Good. Good. This is what I call obeying the map. And this is what I call not transferring your workers. How tragic. So it looks like Cheetah is getting the most ridiculous advantage known to man. Oh my goodness, this is so straightforward. Oh yes, and this is what uh, one of the reasons I actually chose this game, is that, man, from pretty much everyone's point of view, I'm even seeing people type in the chat, troll a little lol, Zerg's so dead, and etc, and etc. But it's very, very easy to win in this position. So a lot of people stop thinking in this position. They just build whatever. And honestly, anything will help you close out a victory at this point in time. But that doesn't necessarily make the decisions after this rush good decisions. Blink Stalkers, 
mobile units on a wide spread out open map are almost always going to be the better decision. Now, if I were Protoss, where would I expand next? This would be my choice. Because if I am pushing through this center area a lot, I'm kind of going to want to be expanding here. Especially if I'm making immobile units like the Colossus. If I'm trying to be very, very nimble and aggressive with fast units like Blink Stalkers, I might favor this expansion a little bit more. Because this is just farther away. It's in more open space that aligns a little bit better with what my Blink Stalkers are all about. So now we're seeing the morph to the Archon. This is another very, very nice play. We're seeing more Dark Templar get morphed in for another Archon. For any of you who didn't know, Archons do a stupid amount of damage. 35 versus Biological. And ooh, it combines the kill counts. Ooh, Executor Archon, welcome to the battle. So we're seeing more gateways go down. And this is one of the greatest things ever when someone just starts walling themselves in. This, I think, is just fantastic. And more plays that I think would be great on this map. Going six or seven gateway before taking a third base. Why? Why? Why would I say that? Because it's a huge, gigantic, wide, spread out, open, frickin', frickin', frickin' map. Well, what if he goes roaches with Burrow and I don't have my observers up yet? You can put a ton of pressure on him. I mean, one of the greatest things ever. Let me. Here's a really common technique, right? Imagine this army. This whole army. And imagine, instead of four gateways, there were six. A probe could easily go here and begin setting up an expansion while this giant, fast army was here. C putting constant pressure. Yeah, the roaches with burrow can pull back and do some burrow, unburrow micro, but you can just still do gigantic amounts of damage and get your expansion up at the same time. And here we see, look at this, attempted Giganto counterattack. This is Zerg doing the smart thing, trying to do a large counterattack, given the openness of the map. We see this push, it's going to be fairly effective. Don't mind the sort of follow-up push. Might not do it always, because, um, uh, you know, that, that one Dark Templar harass might not have had the most effective touch. But, you know, Zerg, here's the speed Zergling thing that I was mentioning right at the start. Did this huge sweep down here hardly took any damage, like maybe lost a couple of Zerglings. Cheetah Prime also took hardly any damage. But Zerglings swinging back, coming in at all angles. I'm getting a little concerned that this Protoss guy isn't focused on the center of the map as he should be. It's pretty easy for someone to say something like, Derp, Zerg probably just has one base. Why do I care about the center of the map? I just need to kill his one base. That is the most dangerous thing to do. You're playing on the map first. That is the number one decider on what strategy you choose, how you're going to scout, how you're going to expand, is what map you're on. So if we've already identified the center as a really huge important element of this map in terms of maneuvering things, you got to just control that. There's no reason you shouldn't end up controlling that. That's like if your opponent's down to one base on Zelnaga Caverns going, I don't need those center two watchtowers. I mean, well, it's actually, I have that map loaded up. Look on Zelnaga Caverns. If you have this watchtower and this watchtower, you have the whole center of the map covered. There's suddenly very, very uh, few options for a Zerg who wants to do counterattacking. Same way here. Same huge amount of counterattacks. So we see Protoss just trying to slowly regroup. Pretty hard to mess up at this point in time. Pretty gosh darned it hard, but that is okay. We still want to be as critical as we can. Plus one upgrade coming up. Five gateways going down. Any robo? No, none whatsoever. Skipping a robotics facility. Applying more and more and more pressure. And here we see an attempted bust in. This is generally quite good stuff from our Zerg buddy. Archon's doing lots of damage. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing to note. I think a lot of people will notice that this army is just badass, right? This army is intimidating. And it's a very fast army. It actually splits itself up quite well. An Archon and a couple of units can go off and do their own things very nicely. Not the way that a Colossus army works. So I love the fact that Cheetah Prime's unit composition is in line with the way that this map is structured. And it looks like Cheetah Prime ended up defending this counterattack. And one might ask, 
Is this necessarily bad? I don't see another Expo by Cheetah Prime. I actually think it is important that Cheetah Prime still is favoring a lot of units because, again, we did a three gate and then we expanded. And then we're going to add on a lot more gateways to put on more pressure, and that's a good way for us to secure another expansion. The big thing to note about this whole style of play, let's take another look. Where's the robo? Do you see a robo? I, I certainly, I don't see a robo anywhere. Oh. It's all been about putting on more pressure and just bludgeoning our opponent to death. And a lot of people will misunderstand this. They'll go, oh, well, he, you know, the guy was dead. So we just made some gateways, went for the finishing blow, shazza. I was wondering if any of you have perhaps seen games of uh, FXO's Chef play. Chef gets himself into some awkward positions, and you're like, oh, he's doomed. He's, he's destined to lose. And then what does the Protoss do? The Protoss says, well, I'm going to sit on my ass, and I'm going to get three Colossi up. So Chef has all the time in the world to make a whole bunch of drones to get himself back up into the game. And then when these huge open spaces are where the Protoss engage Chef, Chef ends up winning decisively. And someone might say, well, when could I go for some Colossi and be okay? Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Zell Naga Caverns. All right. Now, let's look at Slag Pits, all right? Protoss was down here. Huge, wide open expansion. Let's look at Zell Naga Caverns. Pretend we're down here. Huge, wide open expansions. Let us conclude the same thing twice. Needs a lot of units to defend. Not a complicated idea, but an idea that's very easily forgotten. So I'm going to bludgeon you in the face with it. A lot of units, very easy to defend. All right, coming on back. Third base on slide pits. Well, either this one or this one. Very hard to defend again. Big wide open spaces here. Pretty big wide open spaces there. My god, on slide pits, I guess I need lots and lots of units and a huge army to defend. Well, what about on this other map? Zelnaga has a very easy to defend third. This one is very, very easy to defend, this back one. I mean, even this back door side hardly even gets um, pierced because Zerg units that have range are so slow and vulnerable there. But rewatch um, pretty much any of the games that the Protosses played, all the Korean Protosses did at the Intel Extreme Masters in Hanover. And again, I say that because those replays are available. You'll see the Protoss be in a really rough spot. Oh no, my attack didn't work. Or oh yes, my attack worked really well. Maybe it's a great spot. What does Protoss do? Well, oopsie daisies. Well, coming back to me and then going to this map. Well, when Protoss ends up losing, he just parks his whole army here in this location. I'll even zoom in. He parks his whole army here. And then what does he do? Well... He expands here, and then he can easily bounce from this location to his front on this location. And what, what does the Zerg have to do? Well, the Zerg has to do either attack this base from this side or pull all the way back and swing around. Big distances. It's very, very, very freaking unbelievably damn easy to get a third. It's so easy that it makes sense to go three gateway and then start to get a Robo and then a Colossus and then expand. That makes tons of sense. That is actually so sensible, I can't believe it. But, on slide pits, I'm very much so against that style. That will get you in a lot of trouble, especially with all the counter-attack paths that are available. I mean, if you take this as your third base as Protoss, where do you plant your army? Here? Ugh, I don't even like that. That's, that's basically not defending anything if you try to plant your army there. That feels very, very risky to me. Even some of those units like the Immortals, I'm kind of like, ooh, her. Right? I don't really like getting too many Immortals too early. Later down the game, don't get me wrong, the Colossus is an amazing unit. We even, in our analysis, looked at this map and realized in these, all these tight positions, Colossi are great. Maybe I might want to be doing something like 160 food when I have three bases, getting two robotics facilities and just churning out some Colossi. That seems like a great play to me. However, we're probably going to need to rely on a lot of pressure from Blink, from gateway units, and just in general, having a frick ton of stuff. Gateway units seem king on slag pits. Obvious enough, right? Seems pretty darn clear. And also, let me make one more note on Zelnaga Caverns. Our third is pretty easy. Our fourth is also pretty frickin' gosh darn easy. I mean, hell, we just now park all our stuff here. Ooh, yeah, we're already defending the gold. We can just sort of pop down here and defend this. It's a little bit of a ways, but hopefully we'll have enough units by then. And if we're here, we can easily swing back to defend this flank. So, yeah, it's very, very easy to get enough stuff 
to defend. So not a big deal. Let's rewatch this game from Zerg's point of view, get a sense of some Zerg map analysis. Now, this is the part where a lot of Zerg players are going to begin weeping tears because they already know how the game ended up turning out. Oh, oh, alas, 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 alas. Now here's an interesting question. Let's think about this second base for Zerg. Let us divine all we can. I'm going to ask you a very simple question. And Mark, I don't know if you can set up a poll in time for this, but I'm still going to ask this. I'm actually just going to get a visual sense. It's going to be a 1-0 poll. If you think that he should go hatch first, type 1. If you think, given the openness of the map, he should go pool first, type 0. So it, should he go really fast hatchery? That's a 1. Should he not go really fast hatchery? That's a 0. 1 is really, really fast hatchery. 0 is not. I'm starting to see some ones pour in. I'm starting to see a lot of zeros pour in. That is a very interesting result right there. Holy freaking cow. There's a good amount of ones, but my God, there are a lot of zeros. And some people are like, two, fifty, burpty, dirt. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to assert the following. It is significantly better to do a fast hatchery. Significantly better in my eyes. Think about why while I get this water. Uh, Marky, make sure they stop typing those numbers. And I'm going to start taking some uh, comments from the chat. Because, honestly, the Zerg point of view is really important to note now that we've seen the Protoss just <laughs> snap with the Dark Templar. But I would contend that the faster hatch is better. Let's take some thoughts from the viewers. Why on earth would a faster hatcher be better? Oh, wow, look, Marky, yes, yeah, like, okay. Woo, these are great numbers. 36% said fast hatch. 63% said no fast hatch. I would contend that the fast hatch is better. Um, unmute, how do, we, how do we turn off the mute? Haha, slow mode has been disabled. Oops, no. Just unmute the chat. Unmute chat. <laughs> I want to get comments from people. My admins are taking over my chat channels. All right, cool. All right, so here is cool. Here is cool. Let me try it again. Here are some cool answers. Let's see. Why would I think that Hatch First is better on this map? I'll even open this up and go to this natural expansion from Zergi. Let's get my overlay out of the way. So here is the Zerg's base. Here's the natural. I'm leaving it a little close to the ramp. I'm going to leave this a little close to the center. All right, cool. This is all the information I think we really need. Todzumir Jetzit says, They need two hatcheries to have enough economy to support the amount of units they need to defend. All right, cool. All right, I like that. I like that. Um, I do like that quite a bit. dum 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 some people just saying, from experience, it just feels better. It just feels a lot better. Um, some people are saying that it's a lot of economy stuff is important. Uh, early aggression is a little bit of an issue. Ooh, let's stop. Let's stop and think a little bit about early aggression. Okay, let's just stop and think in our heads, because early aggression is one part that we need to worry about. And then the mid-game, how we pop and transition out of it. So we're going to continue to check through. Just want to get one more thing. Um, more units for epic map control from Agro Laser. Okay, yep. You know, pretty much everything I think has been touched on. So let's begin with the mid-game, the later stages first. We already said that having a lot of units is the key on this sort of map to defending anything, to putting pressure on anything. Um, so why not just do something that gets us a lot of units? That's so easy, right? If we go for something like fast Zergling speed, sure, we might be able to have like 12 Zerglings with speed. We'll have a cute set of units, but we won't have a lot of units. And units, again, just the core. But it's the early aggression thing that I really want people to think about. So I just want to look at one very important idea at the Protoss' base. Um, okay, let's look at his expansion briefly. Okay, now let's come over here to the Zergs. What generally stops a fast hatch? Well, two gate zealots, but um, very few people do that. I will still, I'll just let you know it's actually easier to hold off two gate zealots with a hatch first. That's just something you'll have to believe me on. Um, you get a second queen ultra fast and you get a super crazy amount of zerglings. But the cannon rush is a little bit of a problem. On this map, 
it might even be better to open up the replay. You know, on this map, if this thing gets cannon rushed, what's so great about it is that it is its own isolated entity. So if there are a whole bunch of cannons back here and they end up finishing and I cancel this, those cannons can't do anything at all to my ramp. Anything at all. And hell, what if Protoss was here and he built a forge and a cannon, right? He blocked this. He can't get his expansion up. In other words, the only cannon rush that's really a threat is a forge on the top of his own ramp and then cannon rushing your expansion. But those are two counter... Um, they're doing opposite things. He count he can rushes to kill off your expansion. Yeah, now he's not going to have a lot of units. But then Zerg's free to expand and do whatever he wants, and then get a lot of units. And maybe Protoss would be able to say, "Oh, I could expand myself," but he can't because it's just too much wide open space. Most Forge first early expands on this map are actually horrible and super incredibly incredibly vulnerable. And the last thing that I would want to add as we're going into this map, you really should strongly consider making a, a, a little bit of an excess of units as a Zerg player on this map at the start of the game. You might consider just making a couple extra Zerglings, maybe doing a Roach Speedling push on this map early because you know what? What can he really do force field wise? I mean, especially if you swing up along this top side, he cannot really hope to completely crush your attack. He can definitely repel it, but he cannot crush it. There are a lot of cool floods with Zerglings and Banelings that you can do on this map that are pretty much guaranteed to do damage. Very Morrow-esque. So we're going to see Zerg. Uh, he's going to end up doing a, probably a pretty typical opening because we uh, we saw it from the other guy's point of view. Bum, ba -dum. There is a gas geyser going down. Very cool. All right. Well, is this in line with our thoughts on the map? Well, really short attack distances. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe if I went for an ultra fast spawning pool and put pressure on, I'd like that. That would be kind of cool. But this isn't an ultra fast spawning pool. This is kind of a moon. This is a moon kind of spawning pool. It isn't anything or it's really exciting. And there he is. Poking into the main. Oh, yes, he's an assimilator. Very cool. Very good. Very good. All right. There's nothing too noteworthy going on at this point. The Zergling is uh, going to pop out when this pool's done. But what I would love to note about this point in time right now is how little we are able to do as Zerg. Just based upon the structure of the map. We're going to end up finishing our spawning pool. We can maybe do a little bit of exciting action. Ooh, ooh, yeah, that's great. This is good stuff. Now, interestingly, I would say that this map opening is better on Taldarim Altar than it is on Slag Pits. Why is that? Because on this map, what we're going to see is that when Zerg is suddenly about to be attacked, he can't do anything. Zerg has no time. Look, look at the amount of time it takes for these Zerglings to get from one base to the other. This is uh, another important statistic that you should record on a lot of maps. Alright, at 3 minutes and 45 seconds, the Zerglings leave the ramp. Doom, 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 doom. This is going to be not a long journey at all. Oh, goodness, micro, micro, micro. Oh, hatchery appears. How glorious. Moving right along. Oh, no. Ooh, he's even doing a little juking action, but it will take about 30 seconds for him to get from base to base. We see him just now arriving. Yup. Woo, that might actually be less than 30 seconds. For any of you who didn't know, 30 seconds is a very short amount of time in terms of distances between bases. 30 seconds is basically no time at all. Hmm, what does 30 seconds mean to me? Maybe some of you don't think in terms of seconds. Well, how long does a roach take to build? If you don't know, what you do is you go to the larva, you try to grab a larva. Oh no, we can't grab a larva. It's about 27 seconds, I do believe. Uh, look at the roach. Yeah, look at that little 27 there. 27 seconds. It's about 30 seconds for a roach. So that means if a huge army begins to start making its way to your base, he'll basically hit your ramp at the exact time that the roaches end up popping out. You don't have a lot of leeway. Zelnaga Caverns is about twice that distance. If he moves out, you have plenty of time to distract him to maybe get two sets of roaches out. Oh, that's a lot better. 
man, now I'm really starting to understand why on a map like this, we just need to have a lot of units. Maybe I should take some more aggressive opportunities to poke because not only can I do damage, but I could also defend. Big number, short distances, short distances. So now we're seeing the ugly truth, uh, not that tab, the production tab. We're seeing the metabolic boofed get refurfed. There's the hatch going down. There's an evolution chamber. Ah, what's he going to be doing with this? I'm going to investigate. Now, at this point in time, Zerg can use his usual typical timings uh, just to get a good sense of what's going on, you know? You can easily just, you know, poke around. Oh, get an account. Warp gates should be starting uh, within, um, within the next uh, 45 seconds or so. And hey, there's a plus one Zergling attack. Okay, why do we love this play? Because it implies that this player is going to be doing a lot of junk with Zerglings early on. Very fast unit, very mobile. Can easily bounce uh, back and forth between these disparate bases. This is the sort of thing that makes me go, ooh, yeah, this is awesome. I would hate this on Taldarim Altar because it's so easy to defend um, a lot of bases is Protoss. They're very, very close together. There's not really any room for the Zerglings to do anything, but hell, look at this entire flank. This whole side is very vulnerable. So, by the way, we're seeing the Dark Shrine go down. Let's see what Zerg has in store next. Oh, goodness. Could he? Could he be? Could he be? The answer is going to be yes! Yeah. Come on. Come on. That would have been so good. Why didn't you do it? Okay. I, he'll end up throwing this down eventually. I'm actually at times eight. All right. Cool. Yes. He threw it down. All right. And how for me to calm down and go back to a normal point in the game. So in, what we're actually seeing the Zerg do is he's staying low tech. He's expanding excessively. He's getting a third base. Oh, my goodness. At the 45 second mark. Protoss has hardly started his own second base when Zerg's starting his third. And another hatchery for Macro. This is, in fact, an absolutely brilliant build by the Protoss player. I love the, er, the Zerg player. Excuse me. This is a brilliant build by the Zerg player. I love, 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 love this build. This is great because we have a lot of Zerglings that we are going to have out for defense. Oh, gosh. Look at that. Controlling the Zelnaga Watchtower. Genius use of the map. In fact, the only thing that could really sneak by is stuff on this half, but you know what? Hardly any Protoss is really going to be venturing all the way far north. And if Protoss does, all these units up here, again, look at the map, again, come here. That's units that are here. If units are here on the map, they are completely cut off from reinforcements, and more importantly, counterattack path open from main, or excuse me, from natural expansion to natural expansion. So, in other words, counterattacking is great. Great, so good, and all this made possible. Thank you very much to this center, Zelnaga Watchtower being taken. This is so awesome. Otherwise, Zerg might not realize that there's an attack moving up through here. You know, Protoss could do something like move to here and then cut through mid, and Zerg would be completely unbeknownst to it. And we see that the plus one uh, Zerg attack is almost done. This is very exciting because it means we can actually get ahead of our opponent in terms of the armor upgrade as well, which is another pretty big key thing. So you're noticing that there are a couple more Zerglings built, in, uh, a lot more than usual. Look at this. We already have... <sighs> 21. Zerglings out right now. A lot more than what's typical. I mean, you watch a player like Idra play, he'll get two, four Zerglings, and then nothing, and then suddenly 40 Roaches, right? It's a very, very long time, but at this phase in the game, yeah, why not get those Zerglings? Because notice that Zerg is doing as strong of a job as he can not to ever go back behind this line. This is actually a very important thing to note in terms of the movement of these Zerglings. They stay almost exclusively in front of this general area, or as close to this area as they possibly can. If the Zerglings pop behind here, then maybe Zealots and Sentries could position themselves here. But look at the Zerglings, always staying in wide open space. What the hell are force fields going to do in this area? There's an, You throw a force field down, alright, cool, they just wander up this way, or around it. Yeah, look, coming back to this same little area of the map. Little wide open spaces. This is what I was talking about map design wise that's a lot more tactical in StarCraft 2. This space is so important because it just makes Protoss feel uneasy and can bait him into wasting a lot of force fields. 
under attack. So then all of a sudden the Dark Templar roll in and that's just atrocious and Zerg just hates his life and that's fine. Uh, every Zerg will absolutely hate his life in this position. We're actually starting to realize, whoopsie daisies, we should probably end up getting that hatch a little bit more, uh, a little bit built earlier, perhaps before this one, so that way we can actually build a spore crawler there. And this is going to be pretty darn downhill from this moment in time. But you know what that whole setup that Zerg did, I actually like way more than what the Protoss did. Oh, I love what I'm seeing from our Zergi. That is the man. That strategy is the freaking man. So of course we're going to end up trying to build uh, some more spore crawlers. It's going ahead and uh, killing everything, moving right along, moving right along. This expansion is uh, up, vulnerable, but at the very least it's up. Both of these are going to end up getting taken down. Plus one carapace. Um, also going down. Did not mean to go back to my face, but you know what? Plus one carapace right there. Very important upgrade. If you stay ahead of Protoss and the plus one, then that makes your ground units a lot stronger. Um, because it means it's three hits to kill Zergling instead of two hits um, from the Zealot. So, suddenly, suddenly, I want you to just think about that moment that just happened there. I was oogling at this. Ooh, this is, ooh, yeah, getting the hatch and the Zerglings up. Ooh, taking this one. Ooh, getting very fast upgrades for our Zerglings. Ooh, ooh. There's a process that always happens with any strategy where you begin by saying, what do I, where, first of all, what's the map? Okay, slide pits. All right, well, what do I want to do? I have decided that I am going to do a big expand, big unit play, low tech. So I'm going to be doing a speed zergling queen mix, and that's basically it. All right, cool. And then that decision part is out of the way. You've decided as much as you can, and then you have to start, um, what's the best way to describe that? What's the word? It would be like, it's like, what, what do you kind of have to do? What are you forced to do as a result of that? Like, well, I'm going to decide to go Zerglings, but then I'm going to kind of have to get a plus one carapace for my Zerglings. Otherwise, I'm just going to be losing them so ridiculously quickly. Um, all right, cool. I'm starting to obey what my decisions have resulted in me doing. It's a big trap to just kind of say, well, that's standard. I'm just going to do that. Yeah, you know what? I mean, I, I went three gate Dark Templar, but then I'm going to go ahead and get the Robo Bay because that's standard. That's not an argument. Because in a sense, on other maps, you're getting the Robo Bay because the distances are way too big. You can't really put pressure on, but you certainly can get a third base and get a lot of Colossi easily. Ooh, I'm liking that. If you say something like... Um, on this map, you know, you did all this damage, and you see him doing the mass zergling play, you kind of have to get more gateways and continue to put pressure on, exactly as the Protoss player did. If you make some sort of decision um, when, you're, when you really have no ability to, if you've opened up three gateway, and you perhaps have had some success, perhaps not, but you just kind of go for the robo, thinking that, you know, you're being clever or being standard, you're going to get yourself in a lot, 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 lot of trouble. You kind of have to, again, obey the standards of the map. So now we're seeing Zerg. He's going to be completely and totally screwed. This is probably a pretty typical um, looking game for the way that these players opened. But it's so important to note that these openings innately tied to this map and would actually probably not work very well at all on another map. Notice Zerg still maintaining control of that watchtower, still... Continuing to move along this side to double check it, and then here comes a Zergling counterattack. Would always have more Zerglings than what he has right now. Here comes an attempt to just poke on through, but nothing. Look at again how many pylons are here. There's six pylons to wall this off, seven pylons to wall this off, two cannons, a gateway. This is a hell of a lot of stuff just to try to cover a couple of, uh, or cover one base. Zergling counterattacks like this are going to be very, very effective in general. And if they're not, they've at the very least forced the Protoss to nearly wall himself in. And this sort of ultra fast repush by a Protoss player, absolutely excellent. Absolutely just fantastic. I would only just say, dear Protoss, please check up at this North expansion a little bit sooner. We see already at 1 1 upgrades. It's going to be a pretty clean cleanup from this point in time, but. I'm uh, going to go ahead and just do a little bit of questionage, and I'm going to move this off and go to Marky's side. Marky, 
Mark Yoa, uh, logging in. All right, turning on the question script. And what I really love about this game is that it was just so simple. Oh my gosh, it was such a simple game. A Dark Templar rush that was successful and transitioned into the appropriate way to play the map for Protoss. Big gateway play, a lot of blink. What about Zerg? Opened up with a very clever way to exploit this map, but oops, it didn't work out and he ended up crumbling. Really, really important to do. Gonna go ahead and clear this list and start taking some questions. Gonna start taking some questions. Um, uh, people asking more about units, like, ooh, how can I incorporate Archons in? Ooh, ooh. Um, but you know what? I'm gonna avoid the unit focus questions and focus on the map based questions. Let's just. No, no, no. Control, increase the font size. I don't know about you, but I always have like the largest text in the universe. Oh my gosh, it would be the greatest. Um, hmm. 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 Please continue to post more questions. People asking about Terran. What? Are you guys crazy? Um, Nomad1234 asks some great questions. Uh, Dear Day 9, what if uh, it was close spawn in that map? Do you still think it's better to hatch first? For the record, the close spawns on slag pits are stupidly close. Like, here's a hatch, and then doop the doop. Oh, look, I'm already at his base. Um, I would if you can get away with it, but, you know, make sure you scout with a drone. Because, important things to note... What really is Protoss going to do about your early expansion, other than, you know, just try to block the hatch, right? If he goes Forge first, you have the easiest counterattack in the world and counter pressure, and you can easily secure another second base. If he goes one gate and then tech, then yeah, he can't really put any pressure on like at all. You're in great, great, great shape. The important thing to note is that you just kind of need a lot of really strong, really fast units to be able to secure a lot of bases on that map. So what if you absolutely just couldn't get the expansion up? I would prefer going for an evolution chamber on one base and just starting an upgrade. I mean, people, you saw him get zergling speed. Why do that? Why not just go like, you know spawning pool and then delay your gas a little bit and then go gas evo chamber then kill off the pylon and get a plus one while you're taking the expansion why not why not it's a cool way to end up getting super early one one upgrades and then you can continue to put on pressure with the speed zerglings um let's see here yeah yeah there's some really cool stuff here are some questions Hey, Slap Happy Sid says, Dear Day 9, what are other things you would suggest that Zerg could exploit in open areas? On open maps, your third queen? March her ass into the middle of the freaking map with an overlord and just drop a creep tumor there. It is so easy to do this, I cannot tell you. Like, you know, it, you start spreading the creep like this, that's fine, but you know what? There's often, you know, you'll have an overlord hanging out over here. Send a queen to this part of the map. Drop some creep, drop a creep tumor, move up here, drop a creep tumor, and just start creeping up all over the map. It's really awkward for Protoss, you know, who's advancing forward, and he sees this as like the creep event horizon. This is when the creep just runs out of space. But then when he's trying to expand, and there's already creep tumors everywhere here, and it's blocking his expansion, it doesn't even matter if he moves units there to kill him off. Oh my gosh, he has to end up with a million more minutes to be able to even start building a nexus because there's creep everywhere. Or, hey, what about, you know, if he brings all his units here to kill off creep tumors, if he brings just few a few units, you have speed zerglings, you can kill them off. If he brings his whole army, you can counterattack just by proactively spreading creep and having presence on opposite ends of the map. It's very, very good. Another way to exploit this is by having expansions all over the place. You can nidus worm all over the place as well. Mutalists are actually surprisingly effective in these sorts of situations, um, uh, especially due to like the back door area. But you know, when you start spreading out like a lot, ooh, it's very, very difficult for a Protoss player to deal with, unless he has a huge ass gateway army, which is kind of like what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, Wolfie Knight says, Dear Day 9, are you saying that despite losing the Zerg player was doing the correct type of play and just needs to switch things up a bit or scout more? Yes, that is exactly what I am proposing. 
because, I mean, that style is actually an absolute nightmare to play. I've encountered it most of the time on um, Scrap Station, where there's Zergs who literally do, like, um, expand to gold, like, first, and I, and I don't end up scouting it until it's already done. Because if I scout it earlier, I just cannon rush that bad boy. Boom! But it's kind of the same idea. Imagine on Scrap Station if Zerg exposed to gold first. What can you really do as Protoss... Well, you can just do a usual three or four warp gate push, but what if he's going mass speed zerglings with plus one attack? <gasps> Suddenly, you're in a lot worse of a position. And that is one of the big, big strengths of the style of play. You can take far spread out expansions. So I will take one more question. One more question. Hmm. Hmm. Smoking this marker. Yes, let us see here. Ah. Ah. I'm going to rework this question from Dark Pat GTX 01, who says, I feel as Terran, I lack so much mobility against Zerg, and whenever I attack as Terran, it leaves me open. This is a huge concept that's very dangerous for a lot of Terran players. If you guys go watch the World Championship um, from GOM TV between Sen and, what's his face, Marine King Prime, their first game on Zelnaga Caverns, Marine King Prime got a huge lead. And then Sen did one kind of small counterattack and killed all of Marine King's workers. Done. Game was over. He was so dead. And that's all it took. So now what you really have to do as a Terran player is... Or actually, there, there's two big ways to deal with an open, open, open style map. One is to do what these players did, which is to make lots of units to embrace it, get a mobile army. The other one is to do strong one-punch style attacks, as I call it. Where, as Terran, you sit defend, 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 defend. Lower the depots, move an army out, raise the depots... Keep everything rallied to your the bottom of your ramp. Maybe have a backup bunker. This is what Boxer did against Sen in the Team Liquid Star League that we just casted this weekend. And then you move out with your giant one-punch army, and it is designed to do maximum damage. This is the way that timing pushes worked in um, Brood War. It's the way they continue to work in StarCraft II. That there's one player who kind of sacrifices map control completely to build up a giant death army that's designed to kill the Zerg in one fell swoop. Or the Terran or the Protoss or whatever it is. So that is a good way to deal with that as a Terran player. The other one is to um, incorporate more mobile units into your army. This is what Joe does. He just has a lot of Vikings and Hellions in a lot of matchups where you wouldn't even think Viking and Hellions would be good, but they're so mobile that he can just spread himself out. Sure, he'll have a core of Marines, Marauders, and Tanks, but man, there's like 12 Hellions in that, in that army. Oh, that's so weird. Very, very, very good at doing it. Has very deliberate unit compositions. That's wrapping up the daily. I'm just going to go. I have to watch Game of Thrones. Goodbye, you guys. Goodbye.